How do we measure radio? How do we know if we're in our limits that we need to be in? Well, that is our topic of conversation today. So get your learning caps on because here we go. Hello, I'm Marcos O'Rourke. I'm a broadcast engineer in the Southern California area. So I am gonna take you a little bit of kind of behind the scenes where I'm gonna show you one of my tools that I use, one of my favorite tools that I get to use. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about how we measure RF for all of our stations. So let's start off with a little bit of technical detail and how we define what we're looking at. So we're gonna be looking at frequency, not RF power. So there's, those are two different things. RF power is how much power and how much energy we're pushing out. RF frequency is where on the electromagnetic spectrum is that power that we're pushing out. So power is not what we're talking about. Frequency is what we're talking about today. To start our discussion, we're gonna talk about the international system of measurements or uh, what do we call it? International System of Units or SI units. And you may have heard these. Kilo for a thousand, mega for a million, micro. All those are different prefixes that we put on the front of whatever the unit is. So kilometers is 1,000 meters. Uh, kilograms, a thousand grams. So in this case, what we use is Hertz. And that is the measurement of uh, a cycle of frequency. So let's look at our frequency domain here as a line, okay? We're looking at an uh, array of RF energy coming right across this way, okay? <laughs> I'm kind of explaining it weird. So we're looking at a ray of RF energy. And so if we look at it as a waveform, so this is zero, and as that energy goes up and down and back to zero, that from here to here is one cycle. Now, how many of these up and down cycles do we do in a second is what we call Hertz. That's how we measure it. So one Hertz is one cycle per second. One kilohertz is 1000 cycles per second. One megahertz is 1 million cycles per second. So we're gonna be using some terms, kilohertz, megahertz. So that's what I'm referring to. Now, if we start looking at the frequency domain and with most of our stations, actually all of our stations, the radio stations that you hear on the radio are frequency modulated. That's what the FM means. So you have your carrier, uh, your carrier frequency, whatever it is, let's say 95.1, that's your carrier frequency. And what happens is it kind of modulates like this from that 95.1 and how it does that is how the audio comes through and gets from the station to you. So remember those cycles is how many times we modulate per second. So a 95.1 station we are modulating 95,100,000 times per second. Seems kind of fast. Well, it is, it's basically light. That's all RF is, is light in a different part of the frequency spectrum. When you look at your radio, say in your car, you may notice these three little, little letters that are there, MHZ. Now, MHZ is an abbreviation for megahertz. That's one million hertz, one million cycles per second. So our example station, 95.1 megahertz, 95,100,000 hertz. Okay, now that we've got our base, our, our, our what we're gonna be talking about, because I kind of have to define terms so that way when I use them, you'll understand what in the world I'm talking about. So, megahertz, kilohertz, frequency, cycles, okay, there we go. Now, radio, like I said, is just like light, except the visible spectrum is a small slice of the entire electromagnetic spectrum which is from DC to whatever, DC being on or off, on or off. So since we can't see 
RF, like what we have on our radio stations, we have to have a way of visualizing that. And for that, we use a tool called a spectrum analyzer. And that takes that RF and presents it in a visual way for us to measure it and to capture that information as we need to. So the spectrum analyzer shows us this squiggly little line and what that's really doing is going from one end of that little window of the spectrum and just sweeps across it constantly. And as it sweeps, it's measuring in all these little tiny slices of the frequency. And it displays that as a wiggly waveform kind of looking thing on the screen. You may have heard me mention about doing occupied bandwidth measurements and looking to see uh, what, how much frequency we're occupying is really what it is. So the FCC has a bunch of rules, basically. And uh, what's, uh, let's see, 47 CFR section 73.317. Any emission removed from the carrier or our original frequency by 120 kilohertz to 240 kilohertz must be 25 dB below the carrier. Okay, dB, decibels, that's how we're measuring our amount of energy, basically. So our carriers are 95.1 in our example here. So 120 kilohertz away to 240 kilohertz away, it has to be and if this is our carrier at zero, it has to be 25 dB below that. So that's anything that comes up above that, we can't have it. Kind of looks like a little triangle. 240 kilohertz to 600 kilohertz away from the carrier has to be at least 35 dB below the carrier. And everything outside of that has to be at least 80 dB down below what the carrier was. So that makes this really cool, pretty line that shows us our spectrum mask. And that's what we call it is the spectrum mask. And that basically is this limit line that we have. And anything that goes above that is a violation. It's a nice way of being able to easily see what is going on. And if we have any spurious emissions that happen, outside of that carrier and that may violate our occupied bandwidth. So this is how we measure our occupied bandwidth. And every station has every, every, every licensed transmitter. There we go. Every licensed transmitter has a set amount of bandwidth that it's allowed to use. For radio, it's X amount. For two-way radios, it's X amount. For microwave links, it's X amount. So there's all these different amounts of bandwidth and we have to make sure that we stay in there because if we don't, what ends up happening is that we interfere with another licensed user who could be right next door. So we don't wanna do that. They've put a lot of effort into their systems and building their systems and working through the whole regulatory system. So we don't wanna interfere with them. Kinda ends up coming with a, a nice visit from the FCC. Oh, okay, maybe not so nice, but we get a visit from the FCC. We don't want visits from the FCC. As much as they may be nice people, I really don't wanna see them in an official capacity. Unless they're helping me resolve an interference complaint. Yeah. So the spectrum analyzer can be used to look to see if you're getting interference. You can hook it up to an antenna and see different types of antennas. If you have a two-way radio system, you can hook it up to your receive antenna that's up on the tower. Obviously put some filtering in because you don't want to fry your $20,000 spectrum analyzer. But by doing that, you can see exactly what your receive antenna is doing and vice versa. If you have a transmit antenna and you have some weird things happen, you're able to connect to it and see what is going on. Some of the more fancy spectrum analyzers have other tools built into it. For example, a distance to fault. So if you believe you may have some coaxial cable problems, you can connect your spectrum analyzer with the distance to fault um, tool on it. And it goes and it tells you, oh, 
105 feet to fault. And what it may be is somebody who was bored took a pot shot at your tower and hit your coax cable. Thank you very much. There's even an interference analysis tool, and that is actually kind of cool. That one you can load a map on, onto the spectrum analyzer, hook up a GPS antenna, hook up a receive antenna, and then as you travel around and search for your interference, you stop in a spot. This is also called T hunting in um, transmitter hunting in the amateur radio world. Kind of fun. I did it once as a class with the Spectrum Analyzer company, and it was a lot of fun. So, but basically, you have the map on there, you have the GPS antenna, it knows where your coordinates are, it can show you on the map. And then as you go there with your loop antenna, which will show which you find the null and we can cover that in another video but you find the null okay it's in that direction you can spin this little line on the map and set it so then you drive to another spot and do the same thing and that's called triangulating and then you look at your map and see where all those lines intersect and you just keep coming in closer and closer and closer until you find the offending transmitter lots of fun lots of fun but it's one of the really cool tools that makes doing that easier in a way. This tool is a huge help. It is a huge benefit to being able to do my job. And so many other broadcast engineers use spectrum analyzers in their day-to-day -day tasks. Um, some places even have them in fixed locations to be able to monitor their spectrum in their in their market or like say a satellite downlink they may be using that to monitor that so spectrum analyzers come in many different styles in many different enclosures and you know you may have seen a spectrum analyzer and not really realized it but anyways that's one of the tools of the trade but i kind of wanted to give you an example of one of the tools that I rely on to do my job and to me I think it's a really cool tool I, I really enjoy using it and I wish I had more opportunity to use it and and um, more experience in being able to use it because it is such a powerful tool that it will do so many different things it will help you in so many different ways that um, I just you know, wish I had more experience getting out and using it. And maybe I should just start doing that and bringing you guys along. Hmm, maybe. Let's, let's, let's put a pin on that and come back to that one. If you enjoyed this little tools of the trade uh, video, give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you're not, and I'll see you in the next video. Stay safe, stay healthy.